no one in all the world should look forward to the coming of Christ more than we who are members of the kingdom of our Lord. The next to last verse in the Bible says, Even so come, Lord Jesus. Revelation 22, 20. And I would hope that as we analyze and scrutinize the various areas in the religious world concerning premillennial doctrine and dispensationalism, we would not forget the anxiety and the longing that should be in our hearts for what the Bible does teach on the coming of Christ. In fact, if we're not careful, we might so emphasize exposure of error along these lines, which must be done, that we forget the urgency and the joy and the peace and the splendor of the majestic theme of the coming of Christ. A gospel preacher wrote in a poem, When last journey shall have ended and we stand before the throne, when the book of life is open and the deeds of man made known, when the Lord shall meet the world and shall judge the lives of all, when all men are rightly parted and the reaper's cry shall call, when the righteous are rewarded and the wicked know their end, will the world at last remember that a Savior died for men. And one of the greatest gospel songs that we could ever sing says, One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming. Oh, glorious day. Now let us see what the Bible teaches concerning his coming. Revelation 1, 7 says that when he comes, every eye shall see him, even those who pierced his side. John 5, 28 and 29 finds Jesus saying, Marvel not at this. For the hour cometh when all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. And it's a very clearly taught matter in Matthew 25 that all ten virgins, both the five wise and the five foolish, were rewarded at the same time. And that was when the bridegroom came. The door was forever shut to some. But the splendor, splendors of the marriage feast, the Lamb of God, belong to others. It's significant that in the judgment scene of Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46, those on the left hand, those on the right hand, the goats, the sheep, those rewarded with eternal bliss, and those sent to be with the devil and his angels, that this situation took place simultaneously. And in Revelation chapter 19, a chapter that is often cited by Hal Lindsay and others, there is this very same analogy. Two feasts are being conducted at the same time. The righteous are feasting in the marriage feast of the Lamb of God, and the ungodly are feasted upon by birds of prey. Thus much of the rapture tribulation teaching is proved false by these views of reward, of judgment, of punishment, of righteousness, of hellishness. Dr. DeHaan, a famous radio preacher of the North, not the younger one, but uh, his father, years ago wrote a pamphlet that became famous on the subject of the rapture. It excited people to the nth degree, and that's the purpose of this doctrine, incidentally. But in this uh, little tract he wrote, he said, one day wicked men will wake up and their wife will not be in the room where she was the night before. The children will be gone. You rush out on the highways and see uh, multitudes of automobiles that uh, have crushed together. And he said, this will be the rapture and the righteous will have been taken away. And the tribulation will begin for this man and others like him. And it will last for seven years. He also said in his little pamphlet, this would be silent, it'd be quiet. No one would know what had happened. I know one thing, that uh, that couldn't be in our day because at all hours of day and night, some truckers will be on the highway. And with their CBs, they're going to let the world know about it. It won't be quiet at all. In the Schofield Bible, page 1228, we read, quote, All will be silent, secret, mysterious. In the book, The Lord's Return, on page 260, we read, Quickly and invisibly, unperceived by the world, the Lord will come as a thief in the night and catch away his waiting saints. You know what Lindsay calls the rapture in his books? The ultimate trip. Sometimes he refers to it as the translation, and every time those fellows use a term in the Bible, they get caught up with themselves. But when we read the word translation in Colossians 1.13, it speaks of those in the first century that had been delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. 
In 1 Corinthians 14.33, we have a verse that takes care of Dehan's tract and all of the teaching concerning the confusion when the Lord comes to rapture, to catch away, to lift up his saints. That verse says, Jehovah, or God, is not the author of confusion. I know that the doctrine of the rapture and the tribulation is not biblically accurate because it is chaos. It is confusion, and yet God is blamed for it. That just won't work. I remember several years ago when the bumper stickers first came out. In case of rapture, this car will be without a driver. And I honestly did think, much as what Brother Harris said a moment ago, I honestly did think that highway patrolmen ought not to let those people have a license. That's dangerous. And if I were a wicked man of the world and got on an airplane to go somewhere, I'd want to know if that pilot believed in the rapture or not. <laughs> because as Brother Howard said the other night, his time might just come and I'd be in trouble. I guess the most definitive single statement concerning the rapture was by Dr. Robert Strong, and I now quote his statement. By the rapture is meant the sudden and possible secret coming of Christ in the air to catch away from the earth the resurrection bodies of those who have died in the faith and with them the living saints. One of the earmarks of the inspiration of the Bible is its anticipation of religious error. We all, as gospel preachers, preach on why I believe the Bible is God's word. And one of my very favorite points is I believe it's God's word because of its anticipation of religious error. And if a man were to begin a new denomination tonight, and concoct a new doctrine to the religious world tonight that was erroneous, somewhere the Bible already has it condemned. You just mark that down. And every single facet of the rapture and tribulation dogma and doctrine, heresy, is reproved by the Bible. It's to be quiet, secret, mysterious. We've read from three different sources. And yet, when the Lord comes, 1 Thessalonians 4, 2 Peter 3, there will be great noise, the trump of God. John 5 that we've already quoted said they'll hear his voice. Nothing silent or quiet or mysterious about it. Every eye shall see him, even those who pierce his side. The Bible anticipates religious error. Of course, the other part of our study tonight is that the saints are raptured for seven years while there is great tribulation of the wicked on earth. I know that isn't true because I've read... The first seven parables of our Lord in Matthew 13, and one of them is the parable of the tares. And it says that the good seed and the tares will grow up side by side until harvest. That's verse 30. And verse 39 of Matthew 13, the Lord says the harvest is the end of the world. They'll not be separated until harvest, and harvest is the end of the world. So the righteous will not be caught up away from the wicked seven years before the end of the world. I also know it isn't true because I've read the Great Commission. The Lord told his people to preach the gospel to every creature and every nation till the end of time, and he'd be with us. Mark 16, Luke 24, Matthew 28, 20. But we can't obey the Lord if the rapture doctrine's true because we'll be caught up to be with the Lord, leave the wicked on earth, and we can't preach to them till the end of the world. Just one little simple statement after another of the Lord takes care of a whole line of heresy. J. N. Darby was the champion of dispensational premillennialism, and he had four favorite verses to back his great tribulation period. And if each one, with each one, would take the time to analyze in context, again we'd see the anticipation of religious error rebuked. The first one, and this is a favorite if you've ever had a debate with any of those people, this is their favorite one, the time of Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. But anybody who's ever read anything in Jeremiah or about Jeremiah know the time of Jacob's trouble was Babylonian captivity. That's what he's talking about in the context. And then in Daniel 12, verse 1, he speaks of a time of great trouble. And anyone who's ever read Daniel in the background and knows anything about the setting and has studied any of world history knows that the time of great and serious trouble Daniel 12, 1 talked about took place 175 years before Christ in the terrible abomination of Antiochus Epiphanes, in the defiling of the temple, and in the offering of swine's flesh on the altar that resulted in the Maccabean revolt. In fact, if you read carefully Mark 13, where the Lord predicts the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70, since he's writing to the Roman 
people, particularly in the book of Mark, they're to receive the majestic, powerful nature of Christ, and he has to explain Jewish customs, undefiled hands, that is, didn't wash up the elbow, Mark chapter 7. Now, as he describes the destruction of Jerusalem, he can't come right out and say, the Romans, whom we're trying to convert, will be doing this. He gives them a little history lesson of the abomination of desolation from Daniel chapter 9 and Daniel chapter 11. And he said, now, when what happened back there, and that's what they call the defilement of the temple on December 25th, 175 to 165, that period of time, the abomination of desolation. He said, now, let this generation know what I'm talking about. That was the great trouble of Daniel 12. The wicked, the evil Seleucidans that tried to overwhelm the people of God. But then he comes to Matthew 24, 21 and says, this will be the great tribulation and there'll be nothing like it in all the world, in the history of the world of mankind. I know that Brother Deaver has taken care of this. He alone, on his study of the destruction of Jerusalem, which is the finest I've ever heard or read. But if Darby and his cohorts then and the ones now would just be honest with the context. In that very same section he says in verse 35, this time of great tribulation I've been talking about will come upon this generation. But I sometimes think we fail to really give the punchline to that and that's Matthew 23, 36 where he eliminated all other generations and spoke of the blood that would come upon this generation. And that's the basis of the context of Matthew 24, the first 35 verses. What he said in Matthew 23, 36. So anyone who's honest with the text will see that Darby didn't have very good contextual backing. And his other favorite one was from Mark 13, which is parallel to Matthew 24. So his four passages that were supposed to be so resplendent on the Great Tribulation come to naught. One of the real problems with the rapture and tribulation theory and dogma, is it depends upon a falsification of the phrase the last days. The argument goes like this, we're in the end times. The last days are commencing to be upon us. And there are signs of the times that God's people are about to be raptured and the great tribulation is going to come. Well, there are four or five things wrong with that. One is this, the Bible teaches tonight what it taught 2,000 years ago. And yet the Lord hadn't come in 2,000 years. So the Bible must not teach he's coming soon. That's a pretty simple argument. Secondly, what they teach about the last days shows their biblical ignorance. Acts 2, 16 and 17, the last days and the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, go together. Hebrews 1, 1, God in these last days hath spoken unto us by his Son. 1 John 2, 18 is even more specific. This is the last time, and that was 1900 years ago. For the very basis out of which they bring the rapture and tribulation theory just will not fit Bible teaching. The mystery of lawlessness was already at work in the first century, 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. So when they try to concoct all of these people that are the Antichrist and trying to prove that that means the rapture and the tribulation are about to be ushered in, they do greatly hurt. Let's notice in Acts chapter 17, a very familiar passage, but one that we have not emphasized on this point. On Mars Hill in Athens, Paul said, at the times of this ignorance, referring to idolatrous worship, God overlooked, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Notice verse 32. And when they heard of thee, Resurrection of the dead. Acts 24, 15 now takes on greater volume. There'll be one resurrection. It'll be composed both the just and the unjust. And that's what Jesus said in John 5. The hour cometh when all that are in the grave shall come forth, both good and bad. A day of judgment. He spoke of the resurrection of the dead. When will this take place? John chapter 6. I'll raise him up to the last day. Since there can be no days past the last day, the concept of saints being raptured for seven years while great tribulation upon the earth, and then another day just will not fit. John 6, 39, 44, 54, 40, 
And then John 12, 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word hath one that judgeth him. The word I have spoken unto you, the same will judge him in the last day. I forgot a passage a moment ago when both the righteous and the wicked are coupled together in judgment when the Lord comes. And that's Revelation 22, 12. Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to render unto every man according as his work is. And in that context, let him this filthy be filthy still. So every time we touch down on a subject of judgment, the coming of the Lord, the last day, we come out the same place. The dispensationalist makes a big play on Jesus coming for his saints and with his saints. But 1 Thessalonians 3.13 and 1 Thessalonians 4.13 and 14 eliminate that concept. Listen very carefully, and this part is in the book. I'm not following the manuscript very much tonight, but this part is, and you might want to remember it and check this out. In Ecclesiastes 12, 7, we learn that uh, when we die, our spirit returns to God who gave it, and our body, the dust from which it came. Daniel 12, 2, and Matthew 27, 52 make it very clear that it is the body that sleeps in the tomb or in the grave. John 5, 28 and 29 says that when the Lord comes, we'll hear his voice. Those in the graves will be raised. 1 Thessalonians 4 said we'll be raised to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Not so shall we be for seven years with the Lord. But so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now how do we harmonize him coming for the saints, which specific statement is never found in the New Testament for his saints with their concept of a distinction between for his saints and with his saints. When the Lord comes, the body that sleeps in the grave will be raised. He will come with the spirits of men, 1 Thessalonians 3.13. And the body and the spirit will be united. That one line of thinking in 1 Thessalonians alone disproves their contradistinction between for the saints and with the saints. You remember Hebrews chapter 12? He said, you're in the church of the firstborn whose names are enrolled in heaven with the spirits of just men made perfect. Also, 2 Thessalonians 2.8, and all of you by this time this week know that passage. But that speaks of the brightness of his coming. Two words that the dispensation makes a distinction over. There'll be a difference in his epiphany and his parousia. Not according to that passage. It speaks of the kind of brilliance his coming will be in one verse. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 8. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Let's turn to 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 1 to 3. Another passage that shows no distinction in the rapture and tribulation teaching. But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. The day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Notice the next verse. For when they say, now he gets the false prophets in the context. He gets the evil man. For he quotes from Micah chapter 3 and Joshua or Jeremiah chapter 7, 6 and 7. And he quotes what false prophets said in those contexts. So he has the brethren and the false prophets in the same context at the coming of the Lord. Well, what will happen to them? Sudden destruction shall come upon them. So even in this simple text, that the dispensation is reserved for the saints only. The apostle inspired the Holy Spirit says, I'm going to bring some other folk into the study. Now let's turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And this has always amazed me that these people who can write such scholarly works until they get on their pet theory seem to lose all their wisdom. It makes you grateful sometimes to be ignorant. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning with verse 4, shows as clearly as anything could ever show that they have fabricated a distinction between what will happen when the Lord comes. Begin with verse 4. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations. Remember that also. And tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. 
seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. The dispensation says this passage represents what will happen when he comes the third time, at the end of the great tribulation and the rapture period. Well, that's sort of strange. In this passage, he says, and he will grant unto you who are troubled, rest with us. I can just see when I'm raising hands and say, Lord, we've been resting with you for seven years. That one little four-letter word ruins their whole doctrine. The anticipation of religious error. Let's notice. And you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when? At verbal time. At the same time, he comes to be glorified in his saints. Then and when, the adverbs of time in this one chapter ruin the dispensational argument. Very simple, very clear. 1 Corinthians 15. I know verses 23 to 25 have been used in verse 52, but let's turn to that again. 1 Corinthians 15, 23 to 25, and then verse 52 in the same context. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after word they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Now let's notice verse 52. When will this take place? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. When will this be? At the last trump. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 speaks of that same matter, verses 13 to 18, and they were to comfort one another with those words. Now, let's spend a bit of time on the great tribulation. I guess the number one favorite verse of the false teacher, the dispensationalist, the premillennialist on the great tribulation is Revelation 7, 14. Jump into the context without consideration of symbolism, imagery, cadence, the overview of the entire Bible, the thrust of the entire 22-chapter book of Revelation. These have come out of the great tribulation. Of what does the Bible contextually speak? Over 20 times this word tribulation is found in the book of God, and about 85% of the time it refers to children of God living the Christian life, being persecuted by ungodly men while they live upon the earth. I believe that we would have to concede then that whatever the emphasis of Revelation 7, these have come out of great tribulation, it must be in the backdrop and setting of the way that phrase is used everywhere else in the Bible. And we saw it twice in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, speaking of Christians on earth being persecuted Trouble by ungodly men. Well, let's talk about the book of Revelation itself for just a moment. In chapter 1, the Lord identifies himself as the one who was alive and then dead and is alive forevermore. He's trying to get the point across of these beleaguered, oppressed saints in tribulation under duress that the worst thing that could happen to them would be death and that happened to him and up from the grave he arose. He had come out of great tribulation. His enemy said, we'll put you to death. That would be the end of it. But he arose out of that. And he's trying to tell these beleaguered saints that if you will be faithful in the midst of tribulation, everything will be well with you. In fact, in chapter 1, verse 9, John said he was their brother in the tribulation that the kingdom brought. As a corollary to that, in Acts 14, 22, Luke was inspired to write it, and Paul said, with much tribulation, you enter the kingdom. When the Bible talks about tribulation, you can mark it down. It's not about a seven-year period of time while the saints are raptured, caught up, lifted up, and there's great tribulation upon the earth upon wicked men. That just doesn't fit the Bible teaching anywhere. It's a concoction of men. In Revelation 2.10, he said to the deeply persecuted church at Smyrna, 
You'll be intensely tried, but you be faithful in the place of death or unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. In Revelation 3.21, he said, and this is introductory to Revelation 7 to help us understand it in context. He said, at the end of the seven letters of the seven congregations who had met much tribulation, and some of them buckling under it and about to deny the Lord because of it, he said to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. But the immediate contextual argument is chapter 6 where the seven seal book begins to be opened. And when the fifth seal is open, what does he see? He doesn't see the power and conquest of Rome. He doesn't see the war clouds in the Roman Empire hovering on the scene. He doesn't see pestilence, famine, and death of the Roman Empire. He sees the saints of God, those who have been beheaded, martyred for the cause of Christ, crying out for deliverance. And the last verse of Revelation 6 says, The great day of his wrath is coming. Who shall be able to stand? In chapter 7, these, these redeemed ones, these who follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth, Revelation 14, 4, have come out of great tribulation. I wish that those people would read Romans chapter 8 and they'd know what he's talking about. Romans 8, 18, Paul said, I reckon, and one fellow said that proves he was from Texas, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. That's tribulation he endured then. He was looking forward to the rest that would be given the saints of God, when Jesus comes, at which time he punishes the wicked. But in Romans 8, beginning with verse 35, we learn of the tribulation they came out of. Paul said, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus said, Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Matthew 5, 10 to 12. Our Lord said in John 15 and carries it over in the first two verses of John 16, If the world has hated me, the world will hate you. If the world has persecuted me, the world will persecute you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. And they'll even think they're doing God's service when they cast you out of the synagogue and put you to death. That's the great tribulation they'd come out of. And any honest Bible student knows that and knows there are a hundred other verses that teach the same thing. You want to know the great tribulation they'd come out of? First Corinthians chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, Paul said, We're the garbage of the world, the filth, the all scour of the world. That's the way the world looks on us. First Corinthians 15, he said, I protest, but you're rejoicing. I die daily. I stand in jeopardy every hour. 2 Corinthians 1, 9, I have the sentence of death always upon me. That's the great tribulation they came out of. Philippians 1, 29 says, we're not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Colossians 1, 24 said, I must fill up in my body that which is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. That's the tribulation they'd come out of. And on and on the Bible speaks. Jesus said it specifically in John 16. In the world you will have tribulation, John 16, 33. Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world, and I have spoken these things unto you, that in me you might have peace. These come out of great tribulation. To wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb. All that I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Galatians 6, 17. 2 Timothy 2, 11 and 12, if we suffer with him, we'll reign with him. If we deny him, he'll deny us. 2 Timothy 3, 12, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's the great tribulation they come out of. 1 Peter chapter 1 and chapter 4 tells us they'd be tried in the crucible of suffering and the furnace of affliction and only the true gold would come. Pain, the chaff, the dross, the impurity would be dissolved. They'd come out of great tribulation. Wash their robe in the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 1, 5 says, unto him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's a corollary verse. First Peter 4, 12. Don't think it a strange thing when the fiery trial engulfs you. You'll suffer as a Christian, he says, but don't be ashamed of that. Glorify God in that name. James 1, 2, and 3. You fall into manifold trials. Proving of your faith, work of patience. Thank God for it. Revelation 12, 11. They, the saints, overcame him, the devil, 
through the blood of the Lamb and the word of his testimony. Revelation 14, 13, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. They may rest in their labors and their works do follow them. I'm not trying to be facetious now when I make the following statement. Brethren who have heard me preach over the years in different places know this isn't a point brought in just to this lesson. But there is a phrase in a song that brethren sometimes sing that I believe we should not sing. And that's the one that says, May thy congregation escape tribulation. I believe we ought to pray, help us to be faithful when tribulation comes. I know that's far more in keeping with New Testament Christianity, which we claim to be a part of. Instead of saying we're thankful we're not molested, we ought to say, Father, when we are molested, let us be faithful anyway. Let it make us stronger. Now, some of you may not see the full value of all these passages on tribulation that we've shared with you, but I believe if we presented a barrage of these showing the major way the word tribulation is used in the New Testament, then it would be quite evident the concoction of men's theories known as the tribulation, which the Bible says nothing of. You know why my subject was a little bit more difficult than some of these others? You know why with brethren especially it is? They say, well, I've never heard of the rapture and the tribulation. I've read my Bible all my life. Well, that's the point. You're getting the point. So I've got to tell you about something the Bible doesn't say that everybody says it says. I've said all that to say this, and I want everybody to get this point. And I need it as much as anybody. There is something wrong with members of the church who do not eagerly long for the coming of Christ. There is something wrong with preachers that do not preach with urgency the second coming of our Lord. And there's also something wrong with a whole host of members of the church who have no place in their economy for tribulation, for persecution. But I believe the time is coming when this will be a dearer, nearer subject to us than it's ever been before. And if we're not ready, we won't be fit for anything when Jesus does come. I'm talking about ready for persecution. I want to say just one word now in closing about perhaps the most damnable area of the rapture and tribulation theories. And that's the concept that during the tribulation period, part of that time, the temple will be rebuilt and the law of Moses will be reinstated and Judaism will reign supreme. That is the most sacrilegious, blasphemous, anti-biblical, un-New Testament teaching that I've ever heard. I do not frustrate the grace of God if righteousness cometh by the law, Christ died in vain. Galatians 2.21 Someone says, that doesn't touch your argument. Yes, it does. For in Matthew 26, 28, he said concerning the blood he shed in that death, this is my blood of the New Testament. Now you know the next verse, Hebrews 13, 20. It was the blood of the everlasting testament. There'll be no other arrangement to supplant it. It will last to the end of the world. We're complete in Christ, Colossians 2, 10. And then the once for all sacrifice he made, Hebrews 9, 26, 28. And I'll tell you, as bad as that is, to resurrect Judaism, which was nailed to the cross, abolished, taken out of the way, the middle wall of partition, broken down. Colossians 2, and he said, don't you ever let a man condemn you again in regard to a Sabbath day. But I'll tell you what's even worse than that, and that's the teaching on the temple. Stephen was stoned to death for teaching the truth on the temple. I believe, according to that logic, you could say, if Stephen were back on earth and preached that same sermon, the dispensation of killing. Stephen said, God does not dwell in temples made with hands. And in their favorite book of Revelation, chapter 21, verse 22, what does it say? The Lord God Almighty and the Lamb for all the temple that's needed there. The very idea of reviving Judaism, the temple, and all we need is Jehovah God and the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know, all of this study has helped me tremendously to recapture an urgency of preaching. And that goes to 2 Corinthians 6, 2 and Hebrews 3, 15. Now is the acceptable time. Today is the day of salvation. Today, if you'd hear his voice, harden not your heart. And brethren, while we're rebuking error and while we're pointing out the mistakes of the rapture and the tribulation and premillennialism and everything else, let us not forget to stress the truth. Our blessed Lord is coming. 
And we need to be ready for it. And we need to endure whatever tribulation the old devil and his henchmen pour out upon us in the church and out of it so that we'll be ready and have cause for no serious regret when Jesus does come. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful indeed for the goodness of thy love and mercy and compassion. We're thankful that thou hast promised our Lord will come, but has not said when. That we might realize the only way to be ready is to stay ready. And may we live with a deep awareness that one day we'll face the judgment. The everlasting doors of glory will open wide to receive home thy children. And we pray that we'll strive diligently and daily and prayerfully and carefully to be in that number. Use us to thy glory and honor. And may we show those about us who are in error on these subjects the pristine beauty of what the New Testament does teach. What the book of God teaches on these majestic things. That our lives may be useful in preparing others to meet thee in that final hour. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen.